morning, everyone. My name is Ainara Vascuñana. I am FEPS Head of Communication, and I will be running the show and moderating this session. Uh, Ring Ring Europe, mind the uh, regional gap, is a session of uh, Photo Europe. This is the third day, the last day of Photo Europe, but we are still, uh, this is not the end. We still have many exciting things to happen this afternoon. Um, for three days, we have been minding the different gaps. We have been minding the social gap, the intergenerational gap, the uh, gender equality gap, the digital gap. Now is the moment to put the focus on the regional gap. Uh, so how are we going to do this? Because we have short time and many interesting speakers, including the commissioner, Elisa Ferreira. Uh, so it's going to be a dynamic and efficient session that I can promise for sure. So we are going to start with a very short presentation from my colleague, David Rinaldi, who will join us in a second. Uh, then we will follow with a round table. We will do a little bit of a trip around the different regions uh, of Europe. We will listen to representatives from the four regions of Europe, North, South, West, East. And then at 4.45, uh, we will be joined by the commissioner, Elisa Ferreira. So I'm not going to speak much because as I said, we don't have much time, but um, I will be a little bit of a time watchdog and, and police woman, uh, making sure that uh, we stick to the time and we can listen to everyone. Um, David, uh, as I said, my colleague, David, Dr. David Rinaldi, he's FEPS director um, for studies and policies, and he's also a lecturer at the ULB Institute for European Studies. And David, the floor is yours. You have five minutes and I, have, I will have no mercy with you. Thank you. Thank you, Ainara. I have the difficult task to uh, condense in very few minutes some of the preliminary findings of a research project that FEPS has been carrying out with the Friedrich Herber Stiftung. Uh, what we wanted to do is actually to check the extent of the disparities in living conditions among uh, uh, the European people. And we have done that by constructing a composite index that brings together 11 socioeconomic and well-being uh, indicators. Uh, and we include several social factors, uh, employment conditions, availability of public goods, uh, gender quality uh, and equality, uh, political participation and uh, investment level at the local level. Some of the uh, national reports are already out and available, uh, perhaps shared in the chat next to, next to the discussion here. Uh, the European uh, study will only be available in September, uh, but uh, I am already uh, able to provide you with some little hints so that we can check some of our initial ideas uh, with you. Let me try to move to the, my next uh, slide, where you can actually see uh, three big countries, uh, Germany, Finland, uh, and Italy, uh, with a geographical representation of our multivariate index. Uh, the dark green identifies the best quality of life areas. Then, of course, we have the light green, the yellow for middle to low, and the purple areas instead are identifies the part, the regions, the areas, municipalities with more difficulties. Um, as you can see, there are different types of divides, the classical east-west uh, German divide, the Italian north-south, which is reverted uh, in Finland, but it's a common uh, trend in all in the different European countries, uh, which is the divide between the rural and peripheral areas and the more urbanized center. That is uh, somehow affecting all uh, European countries. Uh, but what we want to stress is that these regional divides within European countries are underpinning the social divide. So the, the, the social and regional inequalities are strongly interrelated. Uh, check, for instance, this picture. For Germany, I plug the uh, average gross per month uh, pay. Uh, which is, of course, lower in eastern areas uh, and in northern urban areas. For Finland, instead, I, I chose a measure of access to digital solution, which is, again, weaker in the north and non-urban areas. For Italy, instead, it is a map of uh, municipalities offering child care services, which are much less available in the center, south, and uh, island. So, somehow, for us, uh, once we see how this big correlation between the social inequalities, uh, employment inequalities, and uh, regional uh, disparities uh, are strong, 
the question the question is immediate is immediate clear so uh, what can we actually improve living conditions in europe and fight social inequalities without a renewed strategy that fight the regional divide of course the question for us is rather rhetorical the answer is no uh, what we want to highlight is both for national as well as for european policymakers is that it is impossible to provide equality of opportunities and decent living standard unless regional inequalities are uh, are addressed. Uh, another important uh, matter that we have uh, found in, the, in different countries is this uh, uh, worrisome vicious circle that I tried to describe in this, in this image, uh, which actually deserves some thinking and some solving. You know. So on the one side, we have some worse off areas that are less and less uh, industrialized, they have less economic activities that result in high skilled people moving away. Uh, these in turn results in worsening of, of the conditions that can uh, prompt a relaunch of the economy. Uh, in the medium and long, in the medium term infrastructure and public service investment decrease uh, with a further loss of human and non-human capital. So it's really a vicious circle. On the other hand, which perhaps is a second vicious circle linked to this, is that uh, more and more people and more economic activity concentrate in urbanized uh, areas, so that attract, uh, attract more and more people. There's increased competition for jobs. Uh, the cost of living and the cost of housing skyrocket there's a higher pollution and actually also in this urban center the result is a higher risk of uh, of uh, of social of social of social exclusion uh, so this is for us a big problem and it is a european problem at least for three reasons first of all because it affects more or less all european countries Secondly, because it challenges the unity and the convergence that are at the core of the European project itself. And also because it is partly linked to the EU governance framework that treats the mission to the European mission to territorial cohesion, cohesion with financing, uh, but without a real strategy to fight uh, regional inequalities, which is, you know, it's a fight that is somehow delegated to national and regional uh, authorities besides the use of the European budget. So what the point for us is to understand whether we can take the European mission, uh, you can read here the articles that I quote, to promote uh, the well-being of its people, to promote uh, economic, social and territorial cohesion to the next level. And to the next level, it would mean to uh, you know, to have an order to set them as horizontal objective, not only as a single, let's say, silos policy addressed with cohesion, cohesion financing. So, for instance, it means uh, what is the regional impact of the European Green Deal? What is the regional impact of, of the digital compass or the digital single markets or the capital market union? Can we look uh, more seriously at the regional disparities in the context of the European semester? Can maybe a, a regional angle support the Commission action plan on the implementation of the European pillar of, uh, of social rights? So a new mission for regional policy at the European level. And I conclude by leaving to you, um, Ainara, uh, this slide uh, that somehow clarifies that there's, there might not be a silver bullet solution to solve this vicious circle that we have identified. Um, there, we need a complex mix of uh, policies. Here, there are just some ideas that I have plugged uh, plugged in. But I would be happy to hear from our experts what are their ideas to solve this vicious circle that is at the moment expanding the regional divide within the European countries. Thank you. Fantastic, David. Thank you for sticking to the time. I will. Uh, I suggest that. To take out the, the the slides for the moment because I would like to welcome our seven speakers and uh, like that we can uh, see them all. So if you can uh, if we can do that, and I suggest uh, to the speakers that 
to turn, yeah, and now I, I start seeing you to turn on your cameras. So, so as I was saying, follow, following this presentation uh, from David, uh, we wanted to put some uh, food for thought on the table, some ideas. We are a think tank, so this is what we do. Uh, but what we have been asking our speakers here is to focus on, uh, they have a, a little uh, short time, but we ask them to focus on three points. So. What are the worrisome trends in the countries? Uh, what can we do at the European level? And also to try to reflect uh, together on how can we break this vicious circle David Rinaldi was mentioning in, in his presentation. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, this is a part of the regional calls, the calls, the calls to Europe, because this is what it all about call to Europe. This is our event, and uh, we are going to travel from the east to the west, from the north to the south. We are going to start with the uh, yeah Eastern Europe calls. I want to start with uh, Biljana Borsen uh, from Croatia. Hi, welcome, Biljana. She's member of the European Parliament uh, for the Socialist and Democrats group. She's also vice president in this group, and she's vice president of SPD Croatia, uh, the Social Democratic Party. So, Biljana, I would like to start with you. I have been told also that you have to leave because it's a, a very busy period for you right now. So uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Uh, well, I'm coming from the country, unfortunately, uh, where a majority of country, I would say, is uh, in uh, this uh, vicious uh, circle. But uh, let me say a uh, few things about my country and the, and the situation. Uh, even before joining the EU, regional divide in Croatia has been very strong. South of Croatia is prospering most on tourism, uh, and north and the capital uh, city Zagreb uh, on business activity. Uh, but uh, regions such as Slavonia, Lika and Gorski Kotar are lagging considerably uh, behind. In Slavonia, worrisome trends are visible for decades. Uh, it is a region uh, uh, mainly relies on agriculture uh, and uh, people, especially young people, find less and less reasons to stay. According to Eurostat, uh, Croatia has the second highest uh, depopulation rate in the EU. Uh, this is especially visible in the eastern Croatia, where people uh, in their prime working age are leaving uh, to other EU countries. Uh, what is especially significant uh, is that uh, people are not leaving only for econ economic reasons or a regional divide, but they are leaving because they perceive that, they, uh, that, that the system is unjust, that no matter how much uh, uh, you work and try, uh, you will never get promoted. The state institutions uh, will not protect you if you are not well connected, and that basically the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. Uh, that is uh, what uh, uh, must concern us as socialists and democrats. Uh, the strong divide uh, are growing uh, inequalities in the society. Uh, Croatia has relied, uh, uh, relied on the EU uh, funds uh, to reverse the negative trends, but this has been only relatively, uh, relatively successful. Uh, one cannot help but feel that the mechanisms of applying for the EU funds still remain a mystery for Croatian administration. Uh, the funds available are not being used enough and the um, projects, uh, projects are often not well prepared. Uh, what also causes concerns in Croatia is the sense of inequalities in the EU. Uh, people often feel like second-class citizens in the EU, which has been emphasized when they uh, look at Schengen accession process, for example, or even on distribution of uh, lower, uh, uh, lower quality products on our market. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, the EU is the only way to tackle such inequality, and this is what uh, I'm trying to do in my daily work. What is enc encouraging to see is the, that the trust of Croats uh, in, uh, they, they, that they have in EU institutions, especially in a good response to coronavirus situation. Uh, that, that trust is uh, much higher than 
uh, in um, our national institutions. We, uh, as a socialist and Democrats, uh, must provide ideas, solution, and uh, never forget that social is what make, uh, uh, makes us different from other political options. In the parliament, we are working uh, on not only making our economy, economy sustainable and digital, but above all just. Uh, it is obvious uh, uh, new models of economy must emerge and that current system does not care for people enough. Of course, I didn't give uh, any specific uh, uh, answer to the question how we can uh, get out of this uh, uh, circle, uh, uh, vicious circle, but uh, of course there is no easy solution and overnight solution. I no. hope that I, uh, uh, I managed to, to uh, be uh, in these three minutes. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Yeah, there's no miracle solution. That's that's for sure. But uh, this is what we try to do with these debates to find together uh, what can be done differently uh, to tackle these inequalities you were referring to. And I, I take an, I took note of one of the things you said that the, the EU is the only way to tackle these these inequalities. I think this is an important takeaway. I would like to remain uh, for a bit more in the eastern part of Europe. I would like now to move to Poland. Uh, I would like to welcome and to give the floor to Bartosz Maszalika. Uh, he is co-founder of the Polish Social Democratic Think Tank, uh, Ignacy Daszynski Center, which is a member foundation of FEPS. Uh, welcome, uh, Bartosz. It's a pleasure to have you here. So the floor is yours. I won't extend myself here. Oh. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would start from uh, some sort of polit political diagnosis. Uh, in my opinion, in Central e uh, Eastern Europe, we are living in some sort of uh, triangle. Uh, European Union, national government and uh, local government. I would like to start from the uh, national government and generally from the state, yes, because uh, it's some sort of paradox that uh, in our region, we trust in state, but in uh, in the Western state, yes, we want to uh, build a welfare state. Uh, uh, our societies, uh, as show us uh, many social surveys, want uh, a welfare state, but they don't believe that uh, political elites of uh, our countries are able to build uh, such states that they are able to provide uh, high quality uh, social services uh, and uh, as you know uh, we've got in European Union free movement of uh, worker it is a, pr a fundamental principle uh, of, uh, of the European Union uh, so uh, if some Poles or Czechs or Slovaks want to live in a welfare state, they have the uh, ability to move to such a state, move to, uh, to the West, to the West European uh, countries or even to countries such as uh, Norway. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, and uh, the second issue uh, is uh, that as you uh, probably know, uh, populist governments in our uh, region are um, uh, specialized in putting blame on the European Union. Yes, when something goes wrong, the scapegoat is always uh, obvious, and it is the European uh, Union. But uh, on the other hand, the local governments, uh, even the liberal one, uh, have taken uh, the lesson from uh, the national governments and when something goes wrong in the uh, regional uh, level they put uh, the blame uh, to the higher level so it's the uh, national government and it's for me it's uh, another uh, vicious uh, circle uh, in our in our region yes this, the first one is uh, this with lack of uh, trust in uh, state, uh, uh, our own state, and the second one is we putting blame to the uh, higher uh, level. And okay, we are uh, uh, trying to implement the recovery fund. And uh, to sum up, uh, we need we need to uh, create find some sort of 
harmony between European Union, uh, national government and local government. We want the uh, recovery fund achieve its goals. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bartos. Thank you very much. Um, we are now going to move, uh, as I was saying, to the eastern part of Europe. Sorry, western part of Europe. And as I was mentioning, the idea here is to exchange about what are the most worrisome trends in, in the different regions, but also uh, to find what's common to all the regions, as uh, as my colleague was mentioning at the beginning. So I would like to introduce now uh, to Andreas Schieder. He's also a member of the European Parliament for the SD group, and he's uh, head of the Austrian delegation and co chair of the Global Progressive Forum. Uh, Andreas, it's a pleasure to have you here. Here, the floor is yours. Thank you and good afternoon from Vienna. Just uh, one remark on the geographics. Uh, I think Zagreb is more west than Vienna, by the way. Uh, uh, just uh, saying this. Uh, so, but for sure it is more north. Um, we we'll have to simplify a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but it's, it's, it's showing that the sometimes it's a little bit of what is historically uh, and, and less uh, geographic. But uh, to make uh, w one point on the disparities, I think uh, to put a little bit the, the emphasis also on the uh, economic uh, and chances divide. When we look that, for example, capital market and stock exchange are already above the, the level which had, they had been before the COVID crisis. So this means who is earning his money through stock exchange already has a huge plus in its income, while people who are in normal labor condition are still on part-time labor, maybe unemployed, still under pressure, doesn't know what exactly the future will bring or how the children might get the chances. So we see this divide in our society regionally, but also socially got, gets wider uh, at the moment. So I think what has to be done is to take both uh, situations into account when we now speak about recovery and the resilience fund. This means it is extremely important to invest in infrastructure, in education, in transport, in internet, and also to create for the so-called uh, less developed area, also plans like, uh, could be uh, sustainable tourism, could be a lot of, of other issues which are extremely important uh, also to show that uh, we, that economic, let's say, recovery is not only for the big economic centers, but it's for the people and therefore for, for all of our uh, places of our continent. I think this this would be an extremely important uh, point. There could be a lot of done in infrastructure, but also in education infrastructure. Uh, universities and, and other uh, facilities which can be used. Yeah, I believe this is one of the, the key points we have been mentioning, the, the importance of investing in infrastructure and public services in those regions which are lagging behind in order to break this vicious circle we, we have been referring to. Uh, thank you very much, Andreas. Uh, that was very efficient. I would like to welcome now, I think he's with us. I don't see his camera, but uh, Tom Jungen, if you're, yes. Uh, I think you're coming in, no? Tom, uh, are you with us? He was with us for sure uh, a few minutes ago because we have been talking. Okay, uh, let's give it a last chance. Otherwise we move to another region of Europe and then we come back. Tom Jungen, are we with us? Okay, we'll come uh, back to him in uh, in a short while. So let me now do another move in the European map and let's go to the north. We have with us uh, Anna Martinen. Uh, Annie, sorry, uh, welcome. Uh, she's from Finland and she's macroeconomist at the Central Organization of the Finnish Trade Unions um, in Finland, SAK uh, is the acronym. And she has worked before in the Bank of Finland, Finnish Ministry of Finance and European Central Bank. Uh, welcome, Annie. So um, I would like to know what's your take uh, in the questions we are putting on the table. Um, what can you tell us from uh, about Finland, but also about how can we together rethink the model? Thank you. Um, I think I have uh, pretty much the same same um, point of view as our Austrian colleagues. Um, I'm thinking and I, we're thinking that we need to especially focus on R&D development, green transition, digitalization and um, 
and healthcare. But um, in Finland, um, I want to I want to start with um, explaining how we have um, how our um, regional development has gone after COVID-19, and why we have um, regional uh, inequality and how we could actually improve that. I try to be very precise, um, but the regional expectations and economic development have been actually cautiously optimistic, um, first time since the COVID-19 started a year ago. And it's been a very difficult year. Uh, many sectors and businesses, uh, especially the service sector, are facing many difficulties. And it's, it, it will take a long time for, for them to cover, from them to recover the crisis. The COVID-19 restrictions and the decreased demand have actually uh, had the most serious impact on personal services, tourism, accommodation and catering services and the cultural event sectors and passenger, passenger transport across the country. Um, the outlook for industry is more optimistic, which is uh, reflected in improved expectations in industrial-based regions. Um, it is expected that long-term unemployment will actually continue to increase, uh, which is a major concern for regions. And um, especially youth employment has, has also increased as a result for, of the crisis. And despite the rise in unemployment, the uh, availability of skilled labor has actually not really improved, which is also a problem for the regions. And um, when we come to come to south, uh, as you know, Uusima, which is the capital area where Helsinki is based, is the center of business and government activity. And it's uh, regionally in very good position, even though it's very hard hit because it's um, very profound in service sector. Um, but the, the skills in labor, education and business is very, very high, high quality and versatile. So that's why Uusima is very, very high functioning area. And it's actually, um, according to the Commission's Regional Competitiveness Index, is it's performing very well in, in well-being of its residents, number of high skilled labor and education, technology, innovation and data connections and etc. Um, but the main issues in the rural areas in Finland are there are plenty, um, especially weak access to healthcare, level of healthcare, level of education, data connections and unemployment. And Finland have been um, one of the highest um, in Europe with uh, regional in inequality. And that is mainly due to the very inequality um, unequal um, regional policies in the 90s when the economic growth was focused and it was promoted in business centers and labor migrated to cities left leaving the rural area um, basically blank. But we have a strategy in Finland for um, development in muni municipalities um, in rural areas and it's we have five themes. It's focused in climate crisis mitig mitigation and nature diversity. Second is sustainable development and functionality of connections and infrastructure, as was mentioned before. Um, that, is a, that is a very crucial thing in, in Finland, especially. Um, the third one is renewable business and uh, R&D investment. Fourth is education and, and high skills. And five is citizen participation, well-being and prevention of inequality. And lastly, um, what we think that EU can play a role is especially now after COVID-19, um, we think that the Recovery and Resilience Fund is very, very crucial for Finland because we have high investments in green transition. And um, we think that the green transition investments will be will be very important for us because it's also a possibility for for increasing our our exports and our business, but it's also a threat for regional inequality. And um, we have carbon intensive industries industries which have um, they're challenging in transition in processes and businesses towards carbon neutrality. And that requires retraining resources in employment services. And we think that EU can very highly promote those ideas that we need to transition, but we also need retraining and in an equality, equal manner. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Thank you. So a few opportunities on, on the way. And um, I see that now we have Tom, we can see you now. So we're, we're going to go back 
to the western part of Europe. Uh, from Lux we are going to go to Luxembourg more specifically. So Tom Jungen, he's mayor of a commune in Luxembourg uh, called Rousse since 2008, so for a while already. And he's also secretary general in the Socialist Workers Party in Luxembourg and a member of the of the PS group. Welcome, Tom. So the floor is yours. Happy Hi, and sorry for the problem. So as you, you know, uh, Luxembourg is a small country and by its uh, nature, it's also a cross-border uh, country and its European dimension has been uh, further highlighted by uh, the pandemic. I would like to highlight uh, two points that seem particularly uh, relevant in this uh, context. First, uh, the treatment of posted workers. Uh, we need, on the one side, a strict application of uh, the posting uh, of workers' uh, directive in order to avoid uh, a race to the bottom in terms of uh, workers' remuneration. Strict enforcement together uh, with the necessary controls by the uh, competent authorities. And the second point, uh, Cross-border uh, workers represent around 45% uh, percent of the Luxembourg uh, workforce. And uh, for example, one of the, uh, of the crucial sectors uh, during the pandemic, the health sector, uh, this has led to uh, considerable uh, regional imbalances. Uh, on the one hand, Luxembourg recruits uh, many highly qualified uh, people uh, in our neighbored uh, regions in France, Belgium and uh, Germany. And on the other uh, hand, uh, the pandemic has also uh, shown us uh, how dependent our health and hospital system uh, are uh, from uh, on these uh, workers. Uh, the closure, even partial, of, of the borders would have had uh, a, a catastrophic impact on some of uh, uh, our country's uh, key sectors. Europe could help, uh, and I'm proud that, uh, uh, thanks to Luxembourg's uh, Commissioner for Employment and, and Social Affair, uh, Rights, Nicola Schmidt, uh, important elements uh, also of the social pillar uh, have been put at the top of uh, the EU policy agenda, uh, such as uh, decent uh, minimum uh, wages, uh, better regulation uh, of uh, platform workers, and uh, a EU uh, child guarantee, only to give this examples. In general, I think that our union uh, uh, should be more ambitious, uh, also on uh, public services, uh, I think we are all uh, we're all seeing that the uh, COVID pandemic has shown that investment in public uh, services is essential uh, for the resilience of our uh, countries, our societies, and uh, similarly, uh, the PES group uh, in European Committee of Regions one also uh, to see greater European ambition in the field of housing. Uh, we lack a European uh, framework for housing uh, that guarantees uh, decent, sustainable uh, and affordable uh, housing for all. Housing costs are rising in many cit cities and, and regions, more and more people are struggling uh, to, to pay their, their rent, and uh, we need uh, to stop this uh, spiral. Uh, when properly uh, supported at European level, progressive cities and regions can play an important role uh, in the fight against inequalities, and uh, their consideration must be a priority in the exit uh, from that uh, crisis. Thank you.
Thanks, Tom. Uh, you have been pointing to some of the topics that uh, we in FEBS we are have been working for some time, which is uh, uh, health workers, but more specifically care workers, and also housing as a source of inequality. So thank you, thank you so much to, for pointing to those issues. I have been told that the, the commissioner is already with us. I believe uh, she's listening to us. So I'm going to uh, move now because we had another representative from the north, uh, Nils. Uh, no, sorry, yeah, Ushakab, Ushakov, sorry, I've been practicing. <laughs> uh, he's a representative from Latvia. He's a member of the European Parliament for the SD group. And he's also head of the delegation, of the Latvian delegation, and chairman of the Council of the Social Democratic Party. Uh, so, uh, Nils, I would like to give you the floor. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, well, as we see, you know, regions that are lagging behind, and when we talk about regional gap, there are lots of features that are in common. When we talk about the effect on societies and people, the way people suffer and the way you can support these regions, I would like to mention some particular features for the uh, country I come from. I will talk about Latvia, and I will also mention Estonia, because Estonia is basically sharing the same situation uh, with some respect. So the difference I would like to mention right now uh, are concerning two things. First, we are talking both in case of Latvia and Estonia about regions which are bordering with non-EU countries. In case of uh, Estonia, it's uh, a northern uh, eastern part of the country bordering with Russia. In case of Latvia, we are bordering uh, both with Russia and with Belarus. And the second uh, uh, feature which is uh, different from other countries is that we are talking uh, about regions with significant linguistic minorities, and in some cases we're talking about majorities. Uh, for instance, in Daugavpils, which is the largest city in Latgale, and the second largest city in uh, my country, um, roughly 80% of population are uh, Russian speakers. In Narva, which is the um, capital of the uh, northeastern part of Estonia, it's something like 90 plus percent of uh, inhabitants speaking Russian. So, when we talk, uh, take these differences into account, I would love to start with one historical example. It was back in 1998. Uh, we're talking about Narva and Ivangorod. So, it's basically one city divided by the river. Narva is Estonian, Russian-speaking Estonian part, and Ivangorod is uh, a part of Russia itself. So, in 98, people in Ivangorod, uh, they were signing an initiative to join Estonia. Because the difference between Russia and Estonia at that time was so huge, and even despite the fact that uh, Narva was never showing perfect economic results, people in Ivangora still were willing to join uh, Estonia. When we go uh, now to uh, Latgale and to the uh, eastern part of uh, my country, Latvia, and compare it, for instance, with Pskov right now, this difference will not be that huge. The difference in GDP per capita between capital Riga and Latgale will be three times, which is a huge gap. But the gap between uh, lagging behind region of Latvia and uh, bordering uh, Pskov is not that huge anymore comparing to 98, for instance, as it was in case of Estonia. And now what we see right now, on one hand, um, differences, regional differences are bad. It's not fair. It's destructive for society. It, it degrades, in certain circumstances, criminal situation, as only one example. But when we are talking about uh, regional gaps, in bordering regions with linguistic minorities, and in case where you are not bordering, uh, for instance, Switzerland or Norway, but you're bordering Russia and Belarus, you have to be uh, taking into account other uh, aspects. Um, I will give you another example. In uh, Latgale, the difference between uh, vaccination rates right now is three times comparing to Riga. It is 15% in the capital and only 5% uh, uh, in the region I'm talking about. It's only one example when we um, are dealing uh, with two factors. On one hand, people uh, in socially uh, lagging uh, regions are uh, sometimes more eager to trust in uh, different uh, seri series of um, uh, worldwide conspiracies and stuff. On the other hand, they are much more vulnerable to the well-crafted propaganda. And when we are dealing with these factors, that means it's not only about regional gap, it's about stability and prosperity of the Union in general. And my point here is that we have to take into account these differences, both when we are talking about support, when we're talking about criteria to get the support, and when we're talking in general in, about the volume and forms of the support. So uh, I might sound a, a little bit selfish when I'm talking that these regions probably should be supported 
a little bit differently comparing to uh, other member states. But again, in this case, we're talking about uh, stability and uh, prosperity of the Union in general. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for bringing into the debate concrete examples and the peculiarities of, of your region. I uh, really appreciate it. And last but not least, I want to move to the south, uh, to my own region. Uh, we have a representative from, from Spain, Rocío Martínez Sampere. Uh, she is, um, uh, sorry, I missed my papers. <laughs> She's director of the Foundation. And she was member of the Catholic Foundation. I think we have a little bit of sound here. Um, maybe mute yourself one second, then I will mute myself. Okay. And she was member of the Catalan Parliament uh, in 2006. Uh, Rocío, it's, uh, you're very welcome. And as I said, we have uh, the Commission already with us. So she will be hearing at uh, the Europe call, uh, the call to Europe from the South. Thank you. Thank you, Nara. Very glad to be in Culture Europe again. I'm a regular because I really like uh, this event that FEPS does every year and I think it's necessary. Obviously, coming last, many of the things I wanted to say, you said them first, so I'm going to try to not repeat myself. But um, I think it's important. Some of you have said it, right? There's uh, When we're talking about the regional gap in Europe, there is no silver bullet. There is uh, not a miracle solution, right? But I think it would help ourselves to structure what are we talking about. And I think here are three dimensions about the regional gap that we should take into consideration also to find the solutions to them, right? First, there is a political dimension in this regional gap. And I honestly think, coming from Southern Europe, that the reaction of Europe in this crisis has avoided this gap so much compared to what we did in 2008. Remember Greece, remember Spain, remember Italy at that time, right? So I think uh, that Europe reacted too little too late uh, in the last crisis, in this COVID crisis, it has reacted as a whole, also in the vaccination things, and this has avoided the political gap I'm not saying it's a complete solution, but it's it's much more uh, it's 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 not a worrying uh, gap anymore so much, right? So I think this is like good a good thing. We need to be optimist about that. The second dimension of this uh, territorial and regional gap is an identity gap, right? And this uh, obviously takes many faces in our different countries, in our different regions. I come from Catalonia. Uh, we can find it as well in other countries, uh, like we had them in France, in, in many, many other, in many, many other countries. Uh, obviously, um, this identity gap has a, a difficult solution, but I would point as well that it is a political solution. The more political Europe we have, the better this gap will be uh, um, will be shortened or will be closed, right? So I said before, yes, Europe has reacted much better, and I think this has avoided the political gap, remember, uh, 10 years ago, but it has to be even mm, more ambitious, more, more hard in their foreign policy, in their appearances, in their political governments to close as well this identity gap. Now we come to the third gap, which is a socioeconomic gap. And this, and David has said it at the beginning, are different, divide, different divides, common problems. Uh, with diversity, we don't have a problem with diversity, we have a problem with the divides, right? And the socioeconomic um, divides are more difficult to fill. There is no simple solution. It's a whole of policies, investment for sure, but not only hardware investment also software investment, right? We're not talking only about hard infrastructure, that we can talk about that as well, right? But here I would say that I envy Bidenomics a bit. Because I think Biden, and I think Europe has a bit uh, to learn from that, has understood that we cannot ask everybody to be competitive in the global world. And that efficiency is not only uh, has to be measured in economic terms, has as well to be measured in social terms. So that we need to find a mechanism to compensate for uh, globalization losers. 
right? And we can live with these uh, two worlds, like one being very string competitive in the world and another that is not, but that they have social salaries, they have good public services, and they have a social role to fulfill, right? And I think Biden is pointing in that direction. I think it's a very progressive direction um, with rent compensation mechanism, and I would like Europe to insist uh, more on this direction because I think that that would uh, start to close this uh, socioeconomic gap. In Spain, we call it the España vaciada, which means that almost uh, all the territory in Spain is, is being emptied because people do not want to live there uh, because they have no opportunities there. And, and I really think that if we go more in this direction, it would uh, at least we would be starting to, to close the socioeconomic gap that is uh, worrying. Uh, th thank you very much. I'll try to, I mean, I cannot speak in the name of Greece or Italy, but I think it will be more or less the um, same problems as well. Well, I think that the, the, what you said was uh, different divides, common problems. I think that was the, the idea yeah. you mentioned. Yeah, I like that. I, I take that uh, as a takeaway. So as I was saying, um, the commissioner is with us already, I believe. We are a little bit behind the schedule, so I will ask uh, uh, to the Commissioner Lisa Ferreira, if uh, she can please switch on the camera if she's already with us, uh, so we can move to the next. Uh, yes, I see her there. Okay. Okay. Oh, the camera. If you could please switch on the camera. There's a little button in the left side of the screen on top. As I was saying at the beginning, it's a little bit tricky, but then once you get used to the platform, it's uh, yeah. pretty useful, actually. In the meanwhile, I will, inter I mean, I, I think the commissioner doesn't need much of an okay. Hi, yes. I you. welcome. I had to press two or three times, I don't know why. <laughs> No problem. It's working perfectly well. Thank you so much. Uh, Commissioner Elisa Ferreira, Commissioner for Cohesion and Reforms. Uh, she's also former Vice President, uh, Vice Governor of Banco de Portugal, former member of the European Parliament. We have we have just here uh, many members of the European Parliament, actually, and also former Minister for Planning and Environment. It's a real pleasure to have you here with us. Um, so we have started a while ago. What we have done until now is we have done took a little trip around Europe and we have welcomed different voices from different regions of Europe, what we call a different calls to Europe uh, from the different parts of, uh, of the continent. So um, now, now it's your turn. Now we would like to hear from you. I think you had the chance to hear to the last speakers. Um, and uh, as and Rocio, the last speaker, has mentioned, there are different problematics specific to the regions, but then there are also common trends. And we believe in FEPS that um, social inequalities and regional inequalities are two sides of the same coin. And this is what we are trying to do here. We are trying to put the focus on, on how can we, let's say, break this vicious circle. Um, so I don't want to take more time from you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, welcome. Thanks so much for accepting our invitation. Well, it's, it's me that uh, I want to thank you because, in fact, it's, uh, I've been listening to just uh, parts of, 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 the, of the discussion, but the people from my cabinet, they, have, they are connected and they were reporting to me what was said. And I think you are really touching upon the most, I mean, the most relevant uh, kind of topics that is, that is very, very, uh, also very timely at this moment. And so uh, to all of you, I mean, and it's very good to have uh, young people and very active people like yourself and everybody that has been speaking. Uh, so I speak to colleagues, I speak to friends, to comrades. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's really a very important uh, reflection and a very important debate. And so it's me that I want to, th that wants to thank you for inviting me to this to this, uh, um, I think it's the 10th uh, FEPS uh, call to Europe. So, uh, in fact, uh, why it is so timely? Because uh, we live in, a, in, in transformational times, naturally because of the pandemic, but also because of the social and economic transitions caused by the automation, uh, the ecological emergency, and the evolving international context uh, where we see a return to power politics. Uh, 
so we have not uh, reached the end of the history. I history is evolving as we decide, as we speak. And we need to face the challenge and be up to the task. We did not come to politics to be the bystanders, but to make a difference and leave a mark. And in these transformational times, our progressive agenda is more important than ever. And I, I mean it. All of these changes, the recovery, the green and digital transition, the geostrategic challenges that Europe is increasingly facing, all must be faced with people in mind. People have got to be at the center of the agenda. Uh, that is what us, the progressists, stand for. And uh, this conference very concretely identifies the su substantial risks we face. We already know that this crisis will be known as the great accelerator, accelerator of a lot of things. But we need to avoid, uh, and this, is, this must be at the center of our agenda, because we need, we need really to avoid that it becomes known as the great divider. And this is a serious risk. This is the risk we all run, the risk of widening gaps, intergenerational gaps, regional gaps, gender gaps, income, income gaps, all these are potentially, I would, I would rather say, they are definitely increasing. The risks are increasing and we must face them. We cannot pretend that they don't exist. We cannot ignore them. Of course, no region can be left behind. No European can feel forgotten. This is the motto that I have been following also, namely as Commissioner for Regional Policy and Reforms. And I am sure all of you share this objective with me. And I would like to, to contribute to the discussion uh, by, by bringing in uh, pro progressive values to bear on three questions. First, can we break the vicious circle uh, that you were talking about, that, uh, that you were previously addressing, that you have a PowerPoint on it. Can we break this vicious circle that many European regions are trapped into? Second, what is the link between social and regional inequalities? Uh, and I will argue that you cannot solve social inequalities without also solving regional inequalities because they are very connected. Third, can we make territorial cohesion an horizontal European Union priority? So my first question, can we break the vicious circle of so-called forgotten places? And Rocio just mentioned this situation. Uh, and, and a lot of, of, of territories in Europe are, are facing this challenge. They are struggling to avoid decline. Uh, opportunities in those territories are very scarce. People live, especially the more skilled, sometimes high skilled, and the young. Uh, infrastructure, infrastructure decays and public services close. So more jobs leave and more people with them. These places come in many, many shapes and forms. They can be former industrial regions, they can be former mining regions. They can be remote rural regions. They can be islands or border regions. But they all have in common this vicious circle. Difficulty maintaining high value added economic activity, which makes it difficult to maintain the public services and even more difficult creating new and even more high value added activities because companies will fear not finding the workforce and the public and private services, they will need to thrive. And let us not treat this as an abstract problem, but there was, I mean, I was listening to different cases in which this happens. Uh, it's not an abstract problem at all. Uh, there is a very human cost. It is the young woman uh, fresh out of the university, suitcases packed, saying goodbye to her parents and, uh, and leaving. 
because there are no local jobs which match her qualifications. And it is the 50-year-old man who lost his job when the factory or mine closed. He wonders what has happened to his once thriving region and how he will support his family. Probably he'll be the first one to incentivize his sons and daughters to move away. And it is, it is many more people who suffer when the jobs go, public services decline and the region feels forgotten. Now you might think that the opposite of this regional purgatory would be some kind of economic and social nirvana elsewhere, but this is not true because the counterpart of regions losing jobs is large urban centers gaining jobs, especially high skilled jobs. But this influx creates its own problems. It's higher congestion, sky high housing costs. Some colleagues were talking about it. Social division into haves and have nots. Human costs uh, here include the asthmatic child who plays, ev who, who plays every day in polluted air, the worker trapped every day in endless commute, the young family we cannot afford to buy even the tiniest home. And what we also know is that these people will express their anger somehow at the ballot box sometimes for those that offer easy but fake solutions uh, to what are very complex and but very so societal problems and economic problems, but very complex problems. So the solution is not a simplistic, uh, I mean, kind of sentence uh, that uh, that that breaks the news and uh, and uh, and the promises. Uh, I mean, uh, heaven on earth. So what is to be done? Somewhere between forgotten places and the crowded places, we have got to to find a balanced medium, a place with good jobs or places with good jobs, good services, enough space to live well a good environment and high quality of life. And can we break the vicious circle in both the forgotten regions and the crowded regions? Can we provide that life to all Europeans? This, my dear friends, is the goal of cohesion policy. If you want the technical term, it is our territorial agenda. The key is to identify the problem, to design the right development strategies with local stakeholders and muster the necessary investments. Cohesion policy supports regions in designing strategies with the partnership principle at its core and mobilize sizable investment. Studies show that even before the crisis, European cohesion policy accounted for something like one in 12 public investment euros across Europe. And this proportion rose to 40 to 50% of public investment in several countries during the pandemic. So we can imagine in certain regions what this means. Cohesion policy invests in the infrastructure and the public services that make modern life possible. Over the last few years, we have invest, invested a lot in classic infrastructure from water and waste treatment to public transport networks, hospitals and schools. And we have got to bear in mind that medium-sized cities have got to be anchors for this basic, basic civiliz civilization uh, assets and, and, and public goods. Uh, this, in certain places, are very much still in need, uh, especially in the poorest regions of Europe. However, a grower, growing proportion of cohesion policy investments uh, target the green and digital transition. And in the new program for 21-27, we anticipate that at least half of our investments will be green and digital, ultra-fast broadband. We need it because we have got to bring it uh, to, the, to, 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 to all the critical places where we want people to live, ensure that homes, hospitals and schools are connected. We also support innovative small and medium companies and give support to their collaborations with research institutions, green transport and systems to build a circular economy, renewable energy and connection to small to smart energy grids, 
support for the renovation wave, ensuring that the homes and public buildings are insulated, uh, tackling in one stroke, uh, on one hand, carbon emissions and energy poverty. All these investments spread economic activity more equitably and make medium-sized and smaller centers more attractive, more competitive, and able to attract high-quality jobs and workers. These investments level Europeans' uh, playing field. These investments will be the more impactful if they result from an assessment, and I would like to underline this. There is no good wind if you don't know where you want to go. So we have got to develop place-based policies and plans that, that really cannot be only done at the local level. They have got to have scale. But if you have a scale, and if you have a full participation of the people there, if local people, academics, businesses, if they discuss the strengths and opportunities of the region, it probably will do more touristic-based, tradable products, uh, cultural products. They don't have to go, and I'm trying to answer Rocio's concern, they don't all have to go into tradables, into open uh, global competition. But there are lots of businesses for local and for for the uh, and for the the public and for the consumers inside the country or inside the region. Uh, but some of them, all of a sudden, they become very fashionable because they have a certain touristic asset or they have a cultural asset or they have something from an innovative or technological discovery that can really anchor a dynamic in that region. What it doesn't happen is if you don't look for it, if you don't address it, if you don't prepare a plan. And these, uh, these strategies, they are, uh, I mean, they are being developed. We call them smart specialization strategies. And for all regions, we have got to find out where we can increase the value added. We are very much aware that the success of these strategies required strong and efficient public institutions administration, university, civil society, struggling, struggling regions often lack them. So we offer to support reforms and capacity building also in these areas. And we offer expertise and exchange of experience in a variety of fields from public administration to the education, labor market. So all regions possess the capacity to develop efficient public policies and implement the investments needed to get out of poverty or to break the medium income trap. I believe firmly that a better settlement pattern is possible, one which avoids the extremes of congestion on one side and depopulation on the other, and uses wise investments to spread economic activity more evenly across the territory through a multipolar development or network of centers. And this brings me to my second point. What is the link between social and regional inequalities? Can one be solved one, 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 without addressing the other? And the answer is an unqualified no. And that is because of territorial equity. Social justice and protection are more important than ever. In the 2021 Eurobarometer survey on social issues, Nine in 10 Europeans consider social Europe to be important to them personally. The recent summit that took place at Porto, uh, and, and, uh, and I, I, I take the opportunity also to join the colleague from, uh, from Austria that was mentioning the work done by this commission with Nicolas Schmidt, and we work very close together. And the recent summit uh, at Porto showed that the issue is raising in Europe's priority thanks also to the, the work of, of, of progressists. But we cannot solve social issues without solving spatial and regional inequalities, because the main drivers of social equality and social opportunity are, in fact, place-based. The number and quality of job opportunities is place-based. Nothing, no policy is, takes place without having a territorial and social reflection. And sometimes we forget this. We talk about investment, about expenditure, about consumption, as if it didn't occur on the ground. 
so the availability and cost of quality housing is place-based. The quality and availability of schools, roads, hospitals, shops, in fact, all infrastructure and public services are place-based. So we cannot talk about social justice without looking at the actual places where people live. This is why cohesion policy supports businesses and jobs, hospitals and schools, uh, local social services in the regions that do not have the means to do it the, by themselves. Uh, and this is why we want to build the capacity of public administration as well. And this brings to my third point and last one. Can we make territorial cohesion an horizontal new priority? There is a fundamental point of interest here. Any uh, policy uh, I mean, ignores social and that ignores social and regional disparities. Uh, at the, I mean, if you ignore it, you do it at, at, at your own peril. As Europeans, we have many great goals. The world's first carbon neutral continent, a digital revolution, an inclusive, democratic and open society. These goals will not be politically possible if they leave part of the regions, part of the population behind. All the transitions have to be just. Otherwise, there will just not be transitions. So those who study populism note that it has a strong regional and local dimension. Regional and local pride is real and a good thing. As Europeans, our culture is strongly rooted in our regions, our traditions, our communities. They all have strong local roots. So social and regional solidarity is not just a moral imperative or a political imperative. It is also the precondition to getting things done and making our European ambitions a reality. This is why I have fought hard to have cohesion at the heart of the European recovery plan as well. I recall that the recovery and resilience facility has economic, social and territorial cohesion as one of its objectives. Also, thanks again to the good work of progressives, namely in the European Parliament. So we have, um, we have also also taken very concrete steps to make territorial cohesion a cross-cutting priority. Territorial impact assessments have been introduced and we have invested in more territorial data, which serves as regional intelligence and, is, and in new economic models with a more detailed spatial component. They are more ambitious. We must all be more ambitious. So my goal, is that all European policies comply with what we could call do no significant harm principle. So can we have a do no significant harm principle to territorial cohesion? I would love to have it uh, because this is a condition to maximize their effectiveness and to ensure that Europe, all Europe, will be part of the European dream of a democratic, open, inclusive society. In conclusion, as a progressive and a strong believer in Europe, I am firmly convinced that we must mind the gaps and that we must close them soon as a precondition for a sustainable future for European life. Let us recognize that social equality has a strong place-based component and that you cannot solve social issues without considering the places where they happen. No matter where you live, from the smallest village to the largest metropolis, you deserve the same chance to get a good job, to benefit from a high quality built and natural environment, and to access public services and infrastructure, from education and healthcare to green public transport, smart energy grids, grids and so on. In other words, social cohesion, which as progressists we pursue, requires territorial cohesion. Let us fight vicious circle where economic activity flows away from poor and middle income regions and the younger and the most qualified flow away with it. Let us build a higher quality of life by making medium-sized and smaller centers attractive, sustainable, and by supporting remote and outermost regions in fully participating in the modern competitive economy 
and benefit uh, from the social benefits of innovation and open societies. Most of all, let us always remember that Europe's brightest and best goals, from the digital revolution to the carbon neutral economy, will only be achievable if we do them together with no region left behind, no European forgotten. Thank you once again. Thank you so much, Commissioner, and thank you so much uh, for tackling all the questions we, we suggested. It has been extremely interesting. And, and we are behind the schedule, but I would like to ask you a very short question with a short answer, please, because uh, it's an opportunity to have you here. Uh, these last days have been very important for the Progressive family. And a few days ago, not even weeks, we had the Porto Summit. I wanted to ask you, um, are you hopeful about it? Should we be hopeful about this political process? And if yes, why? Thank you. I am. I am. I was present there, and I, I, I could see that uh, the kind of words that people usually say. Uh, in this case, everybody that intervened meant it, because we are very, very uh, aware that we are in a crucial moment where the recovery may be done in a K-shape. Some regions, some people get out very well. Some people, some regions are left behind. Some social elements can be lost. And, uh, and having the social partners in a true dialogue there, it, the trade unions were there, the NGOs were there, the, all the movements were there. So this gave another flavor and another sense of reality and truth to what we were discussing. And on the eve, if you allow me, we had another discussion, very interesting, with more than 1,000 participants. That was a side event of this summit, tackling one issue, and I would like to call your attention on it. It's children, children, child poverty. We have got to address it. We have got, before the crisis, we had 18 million children in risk of poverty. Can you imagine what the figure is now that uh, so many people were locked away, they were in crisis, they were unemployed, unemployed. So let's make use of these funds also to address this issue in a convergence and coherent way. And let's not kill the future of people that have, are not guilty. They, they cannot, uh, I mean, they cannot by themselves solve anything. So let's also include them with a very special attention because uh, if uh, they are excluded from health system, from appropriate food, from education, it is a, a whole generation that is lost in, in Europe. And so let me just add this small hint to the discussion that you are having. Yes, I am smiling because you pointed out uh, directly to one of the, the priority topics uh, this year in FEFS, which is child poverty. We have a, a, a project which is called Child Union that we have been working on together with our uh, partners in the progressive family, and we consider that crucial, as you just mentioned. But I don't want to take long because we are, as I mentioned, we are behind the schedule and Come to Europe is not finished yet. But the commissioners, as you can see, we are I am in fact office, pretty empty for the moment, unfortunately, but we would like to welcome you here as soon as uh, the conditions allow it. Uh, it has been a real pleasure, pleasure uh, listening to you, to your uh, interesting insights. As I was saying to the audience, this is not over yet. So please, I invite the audience to move to the next session, which I believe has already started, moderated by my colleague, Maria Freitas. Uh, on, uh, it's an open mic, your progressive call, call to Europe. And we are assessing, uh, it's a competition, we are assessing the different policy proposals we have been receiving these days. Uh, so please uh, don't leave completely uh, to the audience and, and uh, let we meet you in the next session. And I will finish with one sentence by the commission. There's, uh, by the commissioner, there's no regional, uh, there's no social justice without uh, uh, regional justice. Um, we cannot talk about social cohesion without ta tackling regional inequalities. I think it's pretty clear. This was one of the questions you just confirmed. So we will be discussing more and more about it. Thank you so much. And also you will hear from us because uh, as I guess you know, uh, there's a, a FEPS study uh, in the making right now on exactly uh, regional cohesion. So it will be ready in the following months, I believe. So you will hear from us.
Thank you. And active as you are. <laughs> thank you. And thank you also uh, to our sign language interpreters. Thank you so yes. much. Uh, as you can see, we are trying to tackle all possible uh, gaps in this in this call to Europe. Uh, amazing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. And nice evening to everyone.